All right then folks, um, welcome to the next installment of our QSI online seminar series. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Sahand Mahmoudian. Um, uh, Sahand uh, submitted a future fellowship application last year to come back to Sydney and uh, join uh, actually the Faculty of Science and the Centre for Quantum Software and Information at UTS. So um, I'm really pleased to welcome him to speak today. Um, Sahan completed his PhD in, in 2013 uh, at the University of Sydney as part of the, the QDOS Centre of Excellence that ran for many years um, in the area of nanophotonics. Uh, he then um, won an individual postdoctoral grant uh, from the Danish uh, Independent Research Fund to move into the area of quantum optics. Uh, and somewhat unusually for a theoretician, he actually um, started to work uh, uh, really embedded inside an experimental research group um, with Peter Lodahl at the Niels Bohr Institute. Um, and then in 2017, he moved um, from Denmark to Germany and joined the group of Clemens Hammerer at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Hanover. Um, and then he, uh, at this point, he again moved uh, slightly into a new area, and particularly into the area of quantum many body physics. Um, and specifically in the context of uh, novel quantum optical systems such as waveguide QED. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So um, again, uh, thanks very much, Sahan, for getting up early uh, on a <laughs> European, uh, well, it's technically, well, in, in Europe, it's still winter. So um, uh, uh, nevertheless, um, uh, welcome and uh, look forward to the talk. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So and thanks for the introduction. So I hope you can hear me and everything's fine. So interrupt if the if everything if the connection goes bad, and we can try to fix things. All right. So as Nathan said, I'm talking about quantum many body physics of photons in waveguide QED. So waveguide QED, as you can see in this little diagram here, just involves a waveguide with atoms coupled to it. And uh, we'll be shining some light into this waveguide and we'll be looking at what happens to the photons as when they come out. What kind of quantum states of light can we get? So let me give you a brief introduction. So most of us probably in this talk work in one of the areas of quantum technologies. So these, I've got a few examples here. They basically fit into the categories of quantum simulation quantum computing and quantum networks here and quantum metrology. These are some of the areas. <clears throat> and you can see that if you look at the science kind of at the heart of these uh, technologies, it's basically quantum many body physics. So as you can see, I've got some double arrows joined here and that's because understanding quantum many body systems can help us make advances in these technologies. But of course, if we have advanced quantum simulators and quantum computers, we can learn a bit more about quantum many body physics. So I'm interested in the quantum many body physics of photons. And so then the question is, okay, what do we need to, to be able to reach the physics in this domain? So in this, re in this uh, review paper a few years ago, uh, <clears throat> there's this nice figure and it just showed basically the different areas of optics and it's classed here by photon number and uh, the interaction strength per photon. And so, of course, if, you, if the photons are not interacting with each other and you have very few photons, then you're in the area of linear optics, refraction, diffraction, things like this. As you increase the number of photons and you have some weak interaction strength, you're in the area of classical nonlinear optics. So that's... Uh, Know, classical soliton propagation, four wave mixing, things like this. If you have uh, not so many photons, but you have very strong interactions between them, you're in, you can reach this area of quantum photon photon nonlinear optics. So if you have one atom strongly coupled to a cavity, uh, so cavity QED or one atom, uh, one artificial atom in circuit QED, you can be in this area. And then really, once you have many photons and a very strong interaction strength per photon, so maybe many photons and many atoms, then you can reach this realm of quantum many body physics with nonlinear interactions between the photons. So that's what kind of we're interested in. So what do we need experimentally to reach this platform? So there's been a number of uh, different approaches in recent years. <clears throat> 
Uh, so there's been some experimental uh, advances. So uh, for example, Jeff Kimball's group, they've got these waveguides, these photonic crystal waveguides here, and they can trap atoms close to these. Importantly here, uh, you need very strong coupling between the optical mode and uh, the atom. This allows you to get this strong uh, interaction between the photons in this mode and the atoms. So that gives us the strong uh, fo effective photon-photon interactions because the photons uh, interact through the nonlinear medium, which is the atoms. So of course, there are other platforms like uh, silicon vacancy centers in uh, photonic crystal cavities, and of course, circuit QED, which is emerging probably as the leader uh, in this area. Of course, one can strengthen the interaction, but there's also uh, some engineering of the interaction you can do. You can modify the direction of emission and how the light, how the quantum emitter emits with the different optical modes. So there's a number of different directions people have worked in there. So here I have this figure uh, where basically in a, in a lattice, a cold, cold atom uh, uh, setup, you can have an effective interact, non, an effective, sorry, non-local interaction between an atom and many sites in, a, in, in your lattice. And when you have this non-local interaction in real space, then in case space, this means you can control the direction of emission. And so there's a, there's a nice paper here where they do this in 2D. Uh, over the last several years, I've been working on, or I worked on uh, getting this kind of, in, getting a, a kind of controllable interaction in a waveguide. So this shows a photonic crystal waveguide where depending on the polarization of your quantum emitter. So it's a, it's a two levels or it's a dipole in this, in this uh, uh, calculation sitting here. And depending on its circular polarization, it can emit either to the right or the left. So this is a kind of unidirectional interaction. And in this talk, I'll be using this unidirectional uh, interaction. So just a little bit more on this unidirectional interaction. This is an area of physics called, uh, or quantum optics called chiral quantum optics, chiral for the handedness. And to boil it all down into simple terms, uh, one way of getting this chirality, or at least the way that uh, we originally did it, now there are many ways, but uh, the way originally we looked at this, if you have confinement of an optical uh, mode, so here you have light propagating in a medium with some high refractive index, and it undergoes total internal reflection. Here you'll have some evanescent mode. And at the, because of this, uh, just uh, because the mode is strongly localized here, the electric field at this position is not transverse with respect to the, the direction of the mode. And so you can get this uh, uh, longitudinal component and you can get circular polarization. So the backwards, so, uh, the backwards propagating mode is then related to the forwards propagating mode through complex conjugation. So at that same point, it has the opposite polarization. So then if you put a quantum emitter at this position with right hand polarization, it'll only couple to this mode and it'll be orthogonal to the other mode. So that's one of the ways you can get this unidirectional interaction. And these kinds of circular polarization points occur in a bunch of different nanophotonic waveguides where you confine the light strongly. So in this particular implementation, strong confinement of light is important. Uh, and this allows you to get things like directional emission, uh, non-reciprocal interactions, and it modifies the collective effects. And this modification of the collective effects will be important in this talk because we'll have many atoms coupled to a waveguide and we'll be driving this system. I'll be showing what happens when you drive this system with a pulse of photons. So I should point out that even though this is the kind of nanophotonic implementation of this, there are now ways to do it in things like circuit. People have come up with ways to do it in things like circuit QED and other platforms. All right, so in this talk, I'll be showing, uh, again, here's this figure. It's the many body physics of photons in chiral waveguide QED. So importantly, now we see that these atoms, they only couple in one direction. So <clears throat> all this engineering of the light matter interaction 
uh, that goes into that kind of would go into some potential experimental implementation. This just changes the basically interactions of the system. It strengthens the interactions, so you can treat this really as a one-dimensional continuum, and also it uh, makes this interaction this unidirectional uh, interaction. So I'll be going through the physics of this problem, and basically the different parts of the talk will be. Uh, uh, looking at different physics and the different physics of this uh, problem will fit into different theoretical approaches. So I'm not only going to be talking about theory, but basically the different physics fits into different physics, uh, theoretical approaches of mean field theory, many body scattering, and uh, I'll use an approach with matrix product states to do some numerics. So basically we'll be looking at few body physics and many body physics and the mean field limit. I'll then briefly show some near-term experimental implementations, uh, potential implementations, and then a conclusion and outlook. All right, so let's let's go to the the, the system we're looking at. So it's a, we're looking at a one-dimensional waveguide with a whole bunch of atoms coupled to it, n atoms, and the and the the um, so the Hamiltonian ex, uh, that describes this system, you have. Uh, the light modes in the waveguide, you have the atoms in the waveguide, and then you have some interaction between these. And so, of course, the, this is a standard Hamiltonian. The interaction is in the dipole approximation, and you can make the rotating wave approximation. So we make a number of approximations to, to simplify this Hamiltonian. These are actually kind of, you don't have to do anything special uh, to realize this system. It's basically what you get for free in most systems. You have dispersion, which is pretty much linear about the bandwidth of your quantum emitters. Um, the coupling doesn't change so much with frequency. And what we do is we remove, we basically go into an appropriate rotating frame where so rescaling the energies. So these omega terms, they're not important in the dynamics. So we get a real space. Then we write this, we linearize this. So in real space, that becomes a derivative and you have something that looks like this. So the key thing that we've done here is, is just uh, uh, use this uh, unidirectional interaction. So here A's now are only rightward propagating modes and gamma is the spontaneous emission rate into those modes. So it's a single unidirectional mode interacting with n emitters. That's what we're looking at. So importantly, the position of these emitters turns out not to be important when you solve this problem. And that's basically because you interact with these emitters sequentially because you have this unidirectional interaction. Uh, the first emitter doesn't care about all the emitters after it when it interacts with the light because it only interacts unidirectionally. So there's no back action. You don't have multiple scattering. So this means that the position of the emitters only amounts to an overall phase and it can basically be ignored. So of course, in the absence of all these atoms, the eigenstates of this waveguide are plane waves with uh, linear dispersion. That's the eigenstates of just this part of the Hamilton. So that's the simplest thing. So now one, once we write down this Hamiltonian, if you, if you, if you're for, if you're familiar with the quantum optics literature, one will see that, hey, uh, people have kind of looked at this before, at least in a particular limit. And actually the physics of this Hamiltonian is similar to some of the stuff that's been done in the 60s, but in a very specific limit. So in that limit is this self-induced transparency. So what's that? That's uh, basically a something people looked at in this paper and around this time, late 60s, early 70s. Basically here you have a gas of atoms and you shine an intense pulse and they, they observed that the system becomes transparent if the intensity of the pulse is sufficiently large. But for low intensities, this is highly opaque. Basically it's an optically dense gas of atoms. So why does that happen? So why are the two systems the same, I should say? Here, you have very weak coupling between the atoms and this optical mode. You, you haven't done any engineering of this interaction. So basically, the reason why uh, the, the system can be described 
uh, in a similar way in a certain limit is because these pulses are really short. So when you put in a short pulse, uh, the atoms don't have time to emit spontaneously into these loss modes. So basically you can ignore all of these loss modes and then you can say, okay, I have this just interaction between the atoms and the mode that the laser enters in. And uh, in, this is basically, and because you're in the limit of an intense pulse, this is basically the mean field limit of the theory. So just to show some of the results from this paper, if you put in a not so intense pulse as the light propagates, it just dies, scattered out. But once the pulse is sufficiently intense, it kind of reshapes and propagates undisturbed. So how is that modeled? Um, basically, you use mean field theory because you have these intense pulses. So the dynamics of the system uh, doesn't really care about the quantum correlations. And you treat the gas as a continuum because the, each atom does very little to the, to the photons. So you can treat the whole thing as like a continuum, a uh, spin continuum. And if you look at the equations of motion of this system, you basically have some partial differential equation in, in, this, in this limit. So here I'm using the notation of our Hamiltonian that I showed earlier. So the notation in the original work was kind of different. And you see that this system has stable solitonic solutions. So it's a nonlinear set of equations and you have these soliton solutions. So that's what I showed on the previous slide where this pulse can propagate without changing shape. So what's the interpretation of this in terms of uh, the atomic physics? Well, the intense pulse comes, it rapidly excites the emitter and then puts it into the ground state again before the emitter can emit any light. And so all, the, all that the emitter does to this pulse is slightly delay it. And from this velocity, which you can calculate when you calculate this soliton wave function, you get a delay per emitter of uh, four on gamma divided by one on n squared. So it's, it scales with the mean photon, the inverse of the mean photon number squared. So then the question uh, we basically want to ask, once, once you know this, you, you think, okay, does this kind of physics occur in the few photon limit and the, and the many photon limit in the strongly coupled system? So in this system, you have high loss, so you don't get anything in that limit, but in the strongly coupled system, in principle, you have no loss. So what kind, do you get this kind of delay per emitter and, and, and you know, what happens? So in order to go to the, the quantum limit, one needs, of course, a full quantum mechanical treatment. So luckily, this system that we've looked at, actually, it was looked at in the full many body physics limit in the 1980s. So it's actually all this Hamiltonian has already been uh, diagonalized. And what we'll be looking at in this talk are the scattering eigenstates. So the reason why we're interested in the scattering eigenstates is because uh, we're only interested in the photons. So the scattering eigenstates are the states of light only. So that's, I have these A operators. These are create, a fo create photons. So these are the states where you put in some field at the beginning of the waveguide before you have all the atoms. And then you get some field after you interact with all the atoms. And eigenstates are, of course, the states that just you get the same thing back multiplied by some transmission coefficient. So now this is kind of a complicated form. Technically, this system is beta ansatz diagonalizable, which means that you can write, in this case, this coordinate beta ansatz, it means you can write the eigenstates in terms of a product of plane waves. So here we have N uh, excitations. So let me just go through, this is just a normalization constant. These are the creation operators. So as you can see, we have a bunch of plane waves that we multiply with each other. Uh, we have a bunch of wave vectors K, and then we have some uh, factor that multiplies these plane waves. So these factors you can work out by calculating this eigenstate for one and two, party, two excitations and then generalizing it to N. And this arrow just means you have bosonic symmetry. So you have to symmetrize the wave function. Okay, so the take home message though, is that once we diagonalize this system, 
we can build the scattering matrix. So we have the scattering eigenstates, we can project our input state on that, and we have an uh, eigenvalue, and we have to sum over all wave vectors, and we sum over this thing called strings. So I'll tell you what that is in a second. But basically the transmission coefficients are like this. So you can see the transmission coefficient when you're on resonance. So K here is like a detuning. So when K is zero, you're on resonance, transmission coefficient is minus one. And that's the trans, if, if, if you're familiar with single photon scattering, this is just the transmission coefficient of a single photon scattering off a two level system or even a cavity. So now what are these strings? So the strings refer to all possible complex values of K that solve this system of equations. So for let's say three excitations, you can have three real values of K and they can be entirely independent. And that's one solution. So that's a three and these, so uh, the thing is, if you look at these plane waves, you see that with three real values of K, this state will be totally extended in X1, X2, X3 space. But you can also have some complex solutions. And with complex solutions, once I put in an imaginary part here, I'll have some localization. So if I look here, there's a solution where all of these Ks have the same real part. So they all propagate with like a fixed uh, energy and they have some imaginary parts. So that means you have this state being localized in, uh, turns out in relative coordinates. I'll, I'll show more about that in a second. And you have these hybrid states as well, where two of the photons are localized and the other one is extended. And this goes up, I should say that. So these strings, the, the problem here is that uh, if you wanna solve this uh, with an arbitrary number of excitations, <clears throat> um, the number of strings explodes exponentially. So that, that's a challenge. That challenge has actually technically been uh, overcome because you don't have to sum over all the strings. You can do a contour integration. So that's a technical point. Uh, but uh, that, that's also complicated. So once you have the eigenstates, it's not easy to do the calculation, but it tells you something about the physics. So these three body strings are bound photon states. And I'll talk a bit more about these in a second. So now what are we doing uh, in this problem? So we've got the eigenstates. Now we want to drive this uh, system. We'll be looking at Gaussian pulses. So in some Gaussian mode, uh, these pulses will be on resonance with the two level system. So all the two level systems have the same frequency and all the pulses we consider in this talk will be on resonance. So we'll be considering either Fox states uh, shown on the left here or coherent states. And the output state will be probed by either looking at the power of the output state or the correlation functions. Uh, so these will technically equal time correlation functions. So of course, in this talk, I've always been using position. In a real experiment, usually when you measure correlations or power, you do that as a function of time but because the output state of the photons, it's just freely propagating in a waveguide, uh, taking a fixed position in space and measuring the time of arrival is the same as taking a snapshot in time and just looking at the position of the photons. So I'll be using X. Okay, so now, now we've built up the, the machinery of this many body transport. Let's uh, look at what happens. So we get 20 emitters we consider a pulse that's a few times the spontaneous uh, emission time of these emitters. So the input field looks something like this. So in the plots that I show in this talk, I'll be using a, a, a frame of reference that's in the, in the kind of frame of the pulse propagating through the system when it doesn't interact with anything. So if there are no atoms, the input field will just exit and it won't move. So this will be the output field when there are no atoms. So this is what I'll call the input field. <laughs> so now, if you look at a one photon Fox state in this mode, what happens here? Well, basically what happens is this pulse of a single photon is delayed by a lot and it's distorted. 
So you get some this. So that's just because the two level systems are dispersive. So you get a whole bunch of delay and distortion. So now let's look at what happens to a two photon Fox state. So you basically have this blur at the end. So this, you know, uh, this kind of spread out thing. And then you have a strong pulse here that has a significantly less delay than this. So if you look at these two eigenstates, the two different strings that I showed on the previous page, the extended states, these are totally delayed and dispersed, whereas the two photon bound state that has significantly less uh, distortion and less delay. And then you look at the three photon Fox state, the transport. So the three totally extended states, these have significant delay, they're all the way down here and they're totally dispersed. Uh, the three photon bound state has the least delay, that's here. And then you have a very interesting result and that's this hybrid state where two of the photons are bound and one is free. So you have a peak here for the hybrid state that looks exactly like this two photon bound state. It's at the same position and has approximately the same shape. And then you have the another kind of peak kind of here. And that looks a lot like this one photon top state. So this hybrid state is kind of weakly interacting with itself. And it seems like the two photon bound state behaves kind of independently to the uh, single photon state. So it's like it's separable. And that, so that's kind of one of the main key insights that we had uh, in our work, because this says that instead of having all these eigenstates, this zoo of strings, you can really just focus on these bound states. And if you understand these, then you can understand what's going on in the system. So these bound states, let's formalize these uh, in a general way. So the end string for is the, is the totally, is the bound state. And let me just revisit what I mean by bound. So bound, I mean, it has, it propagates with like a plane wave form in the center of mass coordinate. So it's actually not totally bound. It's extended in the center of mass coordinate, uh, but in all the difference coordinates, it's localized. And the localization uh, is with this, it's localized with a, with a, a distance of one, uh, one on gamma, basically. It's related to the spontaneous emission uh, time or length in this case, because we have group velocity equals one of the emitters. And we can also extract the transmission coefficient for these bound states. And that scales with uh, the number of excitations. So it's a number dependent transmission coefficient. So now if we look at, uh, if we just look at the co contribution of the output state just from these bound states, uh, we can actually gain quite a lot of insight. So the bound states have a much simpler form than that original scattering eigenstate I showed you. And this means that it's easier to look at what happens to the output state. So if you project this Gaussian input that I showed on these bound states and look at what the output state is, basically you have this in the relative coordinates, you have this exponential. I've written that here. So here now I've written everything in Jacobi coordinates. So it doesn't matter what this is. That's just this thing written in another coordinate system. But importantly, the center of mass evolution is given by this. This is just the Fourier transform. So XC is now the center of mass coordinate. It's just, this is just the Fourier transform of this Gaussian with these transmission coefficients. So these transmission coefficients are just the, like a dispersive element. So this is just pulse propagation through a dispersive medium. And when you have pulse propagation through a dispersive medium, all you have to do is just look at the, basically look at the, the kind of Taylor expansion of the phase you accumulate with respect to different energies. And this will tell you uh, the group velocity, it'll tell you the amount of dispersion and it'll tell you the amount of distortion. So you, from this, you can extract the delay related to this first derivative 
and you see it's the same result as the self-induced transparency, but not, not now with the mean photon number, it's with the photon number. So it has this one on n squared propagation, uh, not velocity, but the delay. And the other thing is, so the dispersion term is zero because we're considering resonant pulses, but then you go to the third order term. This is the distortion term. This scales like one on N uh, to the six. So the distortion term is drastically reduced. And that's what we saw on the previous slide. The two and three photon bound states have way less distortion than the single photon. So we have this number dependent delay and drastic reduction and distortion. So this thing behaves something like quantum soliton. Uh, and of course we can do a coherent input state as well. So using up to three photons. So Nathan, how am I going for time? We started a bit late. Um, do I have like 20 minutes or something? Yeah, I think that'd be fine. Okay. Okay, so a coherent state we can also do. So we can use our, our uh, technique that I showed that I've been showing and basically using one, two, and three photons. And you could look at the, what happens and you can look at the power and you can look at the correlation functions. And as we see here, the power, so this is for a coherent state with on average half uh, a photon. Um, you can see that you have the power curve in blue and then you have the correlation curves, G2 and G3. And these are totally uh, different to the power curve because this is a single, this is predominantly a single photon here. So it doesn't show up in G2 because G2 is only sensitive to two or more photons. And this thing is the three photon eight, three photon eight, uh, uh, it's like the G3 has nothing here because this is the two photon bound state. And with this equation of uh, a delay that's proportional to one on N squared, you can say, okay, that this is the three photon bound state, this is the two photon bound state. And you can see that this is pretty good agreement with this simple scaling. Uh, you can also look at uh, the two time correlation functions. So basically this G2 that I've shown here is basically this plot taken on the diagonal, but this one tells do something about the relative coordinates. Here you can see that in the center of mass coordinate here, these uh, photon bound states, their width is determined by the input pulse. So the, in this direction, the width is determined by the input pulse. But in the relative coordinate, here the, the width of this function is determined by the actual photon bound eigenstates, which have a width which is related to the spontaneous emission rate. Yeah, so that's what I just said. So then it's, so basically what we have is this ordered state of light, three photon correlations, two photon correlations, and then only one. So then does this extend? So we've built this treatment using the scattering eigenstates. This is very challenging to do in general for more than three photons but we have this simple scaling rule. Does this extend to higher photon numbers? For this, we have to use a uh, matrix product state calculation. So for those who might not know what matrix product states are, I've got a very uh, quick slide to try to explain it. Basically, if you have a quantum body uh, state, uh, which has this form. So here we have two level atoms, which are either G or E then you have uh, some uh, many body wave function that describes this system. Unfortunately, this many body wave function is exponentially large, it, unfortunately, in terms of doing the calculation. So it becomes challenging very quickly to do some sort of brute force numerics. But this many body tensor, if you like, it has many of these indices can be reshaped using sing uh, singular value decomposition into a matrix product state. So basically this tensor with many indices can be reshaped into a whole bunch of, a product of a whole bunch of matrices, uh, each with only, well, each, each with one index, uh, with one of these indices. Um, so this is an exact representation, but import, importantly, in terms of doing the numerics, 
one can truncate the size of these matrices by keeping only a certain number of the singular values. And this reduces the size of the matrices. And you can then run this, use this representation and see if uh, this gives good convergence for your problem uh, that you're looking at. So there are some, the of course, uh, many of you probably know there are theories that say that certain Hamiltonians have ground states that can be represented very accurately by these. As far as I know, for the problems that we're looking at, there are no such uh, simple theories because they're not ground states. They're some sort of driven problem. Uh, but basically, you can check the convergence, and it turns out that this is usually good for these kinds of problems. Um, tracking the bond dimension, as I'll show a bit later, will also be very interesting for telling us what's happening in terms of the entanglement in the system. So now we have a numerical technique for representing the problem. I'll just very quickly go through what we actually solve. Basically, um, we don't solve the same problem I showed before because that's kind of, we don't need to solve the full Hamiltonian. We can eliminate all the photons and just solve the problem with the spins. And that reduces the number of degrees of freedom. So basically you can relate the output uh, photon operator. That's basically what we need to uh, we need to calculate observables involving the output photon operator. You can relate that to the input. This is the input coherent amplitude. So this is just the, 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 the Gaussian pulses. And to the, the, the operators for the different two-level systems in your, in your waveguide. So you can derive a master equation once you eliminate all these photons. So this is a master equation just evol involving all the spins. This has some interaction between the spins mediated by the photons in the waveguide. And there's also a term for the driving. So this is the, the, the driving uh, associated with the input pulse, input coherent pulse. So with this theory, the way it's formulated, uh, you, we only look at coherent uh, inputs. So you can use matrix product states and the generalization to matrix product operators for this density matrix to solve, to solve this and get the output observables. So now we can go up to many more photons. So here's an input coherent state with up to eight photons, uh, on average eight photons. And we have many emitters here, 60 quantum emitters. That's quite a lot. And we can see that the output power, this blue line has a peak here. So this is the two photon, uh, two photon bound state and you can see it agrees very well with this formula that this very simple formula tells us exactly these delays and then the two three photon bound state and then four and then five and you can get up to six photon bound states with this many emitters so from this we can get a kind of physical interpretation of what's going on so the n photon bound state you can think this is something which will have an electric field, the pole, the electric field of this pulse will scale with one on gamma n. And if you think of some pulse that scales with this width, when it interacts with the atoms, this, the reduced delay is due to basically stimulated emission. These bound states, the interaction can all be thought of as stimulated emission. And the narrower and more intense your pulse, the faster the stimulated emission rate. So this, you have stimulated emission at a rate of gamma n. So you get this, and this delays the pulse. This delay will be by, uh, you'll get a delay of one on gamma n, sorry, one on gamma n. And this delay will be kind of spread out between the n photons. And this will give you the, the one on n squared scaling. So this is the kind of physical picture uh, you can think of when these, you think of these pulses of bound states interacting with, with the two level system. So this simple scaling works very well. And then we can say, okay, uh, what about if the number of photons increases even more? Can we go to this limit of self-induced transparency or something like that? Can we get this self-induced transparency solitons? So the bound states look like they're something like solitons. So 
Of course, the bound states are extended in the center of mass coordinate, so we can create a pulse of bound states, so some wave packet, uh, and we can have different number states as well. So we can consider an ansatz like this, and we just say, okay, imagine you have this ansatz and it's propagating through the medium. Uh, what, what, what will this look like? So we can compute some observables. So this is actually quite a detailed calculation, but the final result you get is that this uh, ansatz has observables in the form of an electric field, which is a Sech wave function. And this is in the appropriate limit of many photons and the pulses start becoming very narrow in time. So basically this self-induced transparency limit. And you see that it reproduces mean field theory because if I calculate A dagger A, I just get what I have up here squared. So our many body theory allows us to look at the, of course, the many body limit, but it also allows us to go back into and retrieve the classical mean field limit. And these are these two pi pulses, of course, so you can do this calculation. But of course, because it's a, a many body theory, you can also go beyond mean field theory. And so in this slide here, this delay that you get uh, when you interact with the emitters, here I just said that this whole packet scales, the delay is proportional to the mean photon number. But of course, if you have many, so this is fine if you don't have many emitters, because all these photon bound states, they stay on each other. They get different amounts of delay, but you basically can't resolve the delay if you don't have many emitters. But once you have many emitters and many photons, you need to be able to resolve this delay between the different bound states. And so you can use kind of a heuristic and say that, okay, maybe I have some, num these amplitudes are like a coherent state. Because uh, you don't know that for sure, but because Technically, you have to calculate this C for some input uh, what pulse, but you can kind of guess that at some limit, that's a coherent state. And then you can look at, you can then say, okay, now I can consider the different uh, number dependent delay of each of these uh, bound states. And so you can go beyond mean field theory with this. And so with our MPS calculations, uh, we've looked at this for, up to on average 50 photons and this is for 20 emitters and you can see 50 photons 20 emitters are kind of you're in the mean field limit you have this symmetric set shape pulse but as you go down to let's say here 10 photons you, you see you this symmetry starts uh, you, know, you don't have this anymore you don't have a set pulse and using this uh, uh, equation here, you can see you have quite good agreement when this mean field theory starts breaking down. Uh, so I should point out actually in the 1980s, uh, there's a, after we did these calculations, we found that, that this kind of looks pretty general and uh, si any system that has these photon bound states might have this kind of behavior. And I found this paper, um, looking at the nonlinear Schrodinger Hamiltonian with an attractive uh, interaction. And basically uh, you get a similar result. Of course, the scalings are all different because it's a totally different system, but uh, you get similar equations to this. All right, so now one more thing, we can kind of analyze the bond dimensions and get some interesting insight into this problem. So the, remember the bond dimensions are a property of these matrix product states. And we calculate, okay, what bond dimensions do we need? So how big do these matrices have to be in order to get convergence when we do these calculations? Um, and this will tell us basically how much entanglement there is in the system. And we're gonna look at this. So this is, uh, this is the plot to look at. Um, so here, this is the average number of photons in the input pulse. We're gonna com consider input pulses with electric fields that are kind of like this Sech electric field I showed. Um, so as you can see with many, many, many photons, you don't need large matrices uh, to get the right answer basically, to have convergence. 
And that's because with many photons, you're in this mean field limit that I was, uh, that we calculated earlier. And with mean field theory, these uh, matrices can basically be replaced with scalars because you don't have any entanglement. So very small bond, bond dimension of one, eventually. But when your system has a lot of entanglement, uh, then you need a very a large bond dimension, basically. So you can see if you have not many photons, again, you don't need a large bond dimension because there you basically can't have, you don't have these many body bound states. You just have a single photon propagating and that's kind of easy to, to represent. But then the bond dimension grows, it reaches some maximum. So this is, this is for these curves are different numbers of emitters. And you can see that the maximum uh, bond dimensions is for more photons when you have more emitters, that kind of makes sense because you can get these, you can separate more of these many body bound states apart due to this number dependent delay. And it reaches some maximum and then goes down and eventually here you get this self-induced transparency mean field theory. And these, I showed these frames on the previous slide. So I have a couple of minutes. Basically imperfections, we also considered you can say, okay, now what if I have some losses outside of the waveguide? Turns out that, uh, the so you can get the transmission coefficient of the bound states and you have this one on N scaling. So higher order bound states are more robust to loss. Basically this transmission coefficient is close to one if you have a low optical depth. So yeah, N times one minus B dot divided by little N has to be small. That's a sufficient condition. Uh, so in many systems, you can also have inhomogeneous broadening when the resonance frequency of all the atoms aren't the same. Uh, this then you can ensemble average over this delay term and you see that you end up with some uh, reduced delay. This you can will then just make up for by having more atoms if that's possible in your system, but otherwise you'll have some reduced delay. Uh, and it scales like the square of the variance. So then of course, what happens if you have some residual backscattering? Uh, this is actually a bit more complicated and it depends on the system parameters, basically the number of emitters, the coupling to the backward mode compared to the forward coupling. And also then it depends because you have multiple scattering now, that'll depend on the distance between all the emitters. If the emitters are randomly positioned, then this phase washes out and it behaves kind of like a loss. But if it's an ordered lattice, then it's really uh, kind of system dependent. And we have to do calculations using NPS to see basically if you get the same results. So we've seen that qualitatively you get the same features when gamma L is less than or approximately 5% of gamma. So if you have some residual backscattering, you should be okay. But if you have some fully symmetric uh, coupling, the, the, the system dynamics are totally different. All right, so basically uh, some final uh, near-term experimental demonstration. So in this talk, I've been considering 20 atoms, 60 atoms. I mean, there are no current platforms that can do something like this with this very strong coupling. But you can actually get interesting physics for even two atoms. So here's a slide. So, so uh, if I can draw your attention to this one first, you can see that, so this is the ideal conditions for two atoms when you have a coherent state with on average half a photon. Uh, you can see that the power curve looks like this. You see two distinct peaks. And if you do the correlation functions, you can see that they only peaked here. So this is really this two and higher order photon bound states and this thing here is the one photon state. So you get this separation and you can see this two photon bound state uh, in this two time correlation function. And we considered a bunch of different uh, imperfections so with some backscattering and some losses and the features are qualitatively the same. All right, so in general, uh, I think in this work, we showed that Waveguide QED is a very nice platform for studying many body physics. And in this Cairo 
federal limit, you can do a lot of things analytically. Uh, yeah, so the, the system can be described using these photon bound states. And we establish the relationship between these bound states and soliton propagation in this system. So there's some open things like, can this time ordered state be used for something useful? Like maybe number resolving photon detection. Can you use this as a photon source uh, if you do some sort of uh, time bin selection so you can get some chunk of your output? These are kind of open questions that are kind of interesting. You know, what are the ideal parameters to use for this? Because in this talk, we basically didn't optimize parameters for getting some useful source or detector. Um, then the other question is a more general one. Do you have other 1D platforms that have similar physics uh, in terms of waveguide QED, at least like bi-directional systems or other systems where you can't use beta, the beta ansatz to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. That's kind of open as far as I understand. And of course here we only looked at a driven system where everything is in the ground state. You can also look at a kind of excited at many excited atoms and look for things like super radiance. And yeah, that could be an interesting thing to, to look at. So of course I want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors, um, Giuseppe and Derek, they're from ICFO. They did the work most on the matrix product states. So Giuseppe did those calculations and Clemens here at Hanover and Anna Sanson at uh, Niels Bohr Institute. So if you're interested, this is the reference uh, if you want to look at the paper. So thanks for listening. All right, uh, thanks very much for that talk. Uh, great talk. I'm just going to open up my list of participants and say, as ask if anyone has any questions for Sahan. Okay, while we're, while we're asking, I just wanted to, while we're waiting for people to overcome their shyness, um, I was just uh, wanted to know, um, to ask a bit more about these sort of applications. So you, you mentioned mm -hmm. that some of the interesting applications you might consider for this would be to see what, can you use these sorts of systems to engineer some nice uh, uh, photon sources or detectors uh, and so forth. Yeah. Um, what about um, in the other direction? Uh, I, are there any systems that you know of, for example, in condensed matter or in, um, uh, other many body physics contexts where the the dynamics or the the um, or indeed the the behavior the physics of these quantum optical systems uh, actually uh, replicates uh, the physics in such a way that you might use these as a way of simulating or learning about some more complicated condensed matter systems mm, well this kind of uh number dependent propagation velocity at least is kind of so we've looked at we've kind of thought uh my co-authors and i we've kind of discussed this and looked into the literature a bit more deeply and this seems to be a property of systems that have these uh bound states so basically many systems that have this property of being beta ansatz diagonalizable in 1d have these uh basically these bound states and so if you look at like some of these, so in terms of condensed metaphysics, these spin chains, so like I think it's uh, the X, X, Z model. So if you look at pulse propagation there, you also see this uh, number dependent velocity. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can, yeah, maybe there's a way to do some mapping, but the system is quite different in that sense because the Heisenberg, these like Heisenberg spin chains or these XXZ spin chains, they're the interaction between all the spins is coherent. So you can write it as a Hamiltonian. In this problem, the interaction, if you eliminate all the photons, then the interaction is purely dissipative. So in that mm -hmm. sense, there are some differences, uh, at least at that level, you can't just write a Hamiltonian of this system that maps onto that. But the fact that you have 
um, these kind of you know similar physics means that maybe there is something to look at but yeah I have we haven't I haven't thought of that whether you can use it in terms of whether you can use it for simulation or something and and what about uh, like I mean, one of the things about these systems with many body systems is you, we're often trying to study a small many body system to learn something about uh, some, um, what happens when things scale up to larger sizes. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it seems like in this system, as you scale up things to really much larger sizes, things start to behave more as you would expect from the classical uh physics or at least more more like the many body sort of the mean field theory predicts do you do well, you know yeah. are, are there sort of parameter regimes where this actually becomes as you scale it up it becomes uh more computationally complex to to yeah i mean uh, yeah, yeah so yeah that, but that's what that's kind of the idea that's kind of the idea here right so i mean right. if you have if you have many photons but not so many emitters then it becomes simpler but as you can see if i add more emitters the peak kind of shifts to the right um and it goes up so in this system if you have many emitters and many photons it becomes more complex but you need more of both not more of right. just one yeah right so if you have more of just one it doesn't become much more complex Right, but this is still analyzing it in the limit where the where you're eliminating the photons. Is that right? Yeah, but that's not a that's not an approx not that's not really an approximation. Sure, that's sure. Stronger than anything else we've done. Yeah, right. Yeah, but that in terms of here, um, the, these results were particularly where you were focusing on the spin physics, even though the even though the mediation happens through the photon number. Yeah, but the, I mean, when you focus on the spin physics, you don't, I mean, you can get everything out of that. So, yeah. because you have, you have this relation between the output, uh, for, uh, you know, this photon operate, the annihilation operator of the output state, you have a relationship between that and all the spin states. So if you know what happens to all the spin states, within this limit, you know exactly what happens to all the photons. So, uh, right. No but I guess, you, I guess what I was, everything. I guess what I was meaning was that in fact, this is an interesting system in that respect, because you are able to, um, uh, like if you had to take, if you had to keep track of the photons as well, this would be just impossible to even get, make any headway with, but because you can just in the calculation part, you can focus on the spins that makes it sort of more tractable there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because, yeah, because if we had to have a matrix product state with all the spins and all the photons, that's much more nasty. It would yeah. limit what we could do. Yeah, that's right. All right, I haven't, uh, is there anyone else who has uh, any questions before we finish up? All right. I think it uh, uh, at five p.m. on a on a hot, um, <laughs> a, quite a hot day. Uh, everybody's uh, uh, about uh, ready to to stop work and have a beer, I guess. Um, so um, thank you very much again for getting up early and joining us. It was a real pleasure to uh, have you come and talk to us, and uh, we're looking forward to having you here. Uh, I guess yeah. next year. Yeah, I'm looking forward to being back in Australia and joining you guys at UTS. It's nice to give this talk. Thanks very much, Sahand.